Good evening and welcome to another online Night at the Museum event organised by the Archive at Highgate School in North London. My name is David Smith and after many years of physics teaching at Highgate, I retired a few years ago and now work part-time in, in the Archive. One of my jobs is to organise occasional evening lectures for parents, pupils, alumni and friends. These used to take place in the school's mill centre, which is highlighted on this aerial photograph of Highgate, with the main school buildings in the foreground. Here is a recent uh, close-up of the building. Uh, but a couple of years ago, we moved the venue to the school museum, uh, which is opposite the main school site. It's the building on the left of this photograph, and you might be able to tell that it's a former non-conformist chapel, uh, quite a quirky and cosy space. But sadly, we are not there this evening. One possible advantage of Zoom is that we can accommodate a more geographically diverse audience. Uh, and it also means that our speaker um, can be somewhere else. In fact, Anya O'Brien is going to be talking to us from Glasgow this evening, uh, whereas I am uh, near Carnarvon in North Wales, and we're both a very long way from Highgate. Anya studied physics with astrophysics at the University of Leicester, before spending three years as a teacher in Suffolk. She is now pursuing a PhD at the University of Glasgow on the theme of Martian meteorites. But she also works part-time for the Royal Astronomical Society, where she does her best to make the space sector in particular more accessible to all. When she's not zapping space rocks with X-rays looking for organic molecules, um, she enjoys walking in the Scottish hills and apparently also has a passion for penguins. Anya, thank you so much for agreeing to join us this evening uh, and give this talk. We're all very much looking forward to hearing more about Winchcombe, the lockdown meteorite. Thank you so much, David, and thank you so much everyone for coming and for inviting me. Um, it's really lovely to be able to speak to you folks about pretty much the one great thing that came out of this mad sort of 18 months um, of our lives really and um, so hopefully in a moment you'll be able to see me um, sharing screen um, in fact David do you want to just pop back up and just let me know you can see this okay I, I can are you seeing and <laughs> seeing yes this? I am yes okay. it's fine thank you excellent okay fabulous as David said yeah, I'm Anya. I'm a planetary science PhD student at Glasgow University. Um, so um, I just thought I'd start by kind of taking you back to the 28th of February 2021. Um, try and cast your minds back to <laughs> that awful time when we couldn't uh, go into pubs, restaurants, um, couldn't even uh there was no rule of six at that stage um it was very much as strong a lockdown as we ever pretty much had um and so this was a sunday evening and the beginning of the story at least in my world was this so this was the message history between myself and a colleague on the morning of first of march this year i had spent the late night on the Sunday, the 28th of February, um, I spent that night frantically scrolling Twitter. Um, I do that most nights, but that night it wasn't despairing at the state of the world in lockdown. It was actually out of excitement because there were pictures and videos all over the internet of a meteor, actually a fireball, which is a meteor that lasts for more than about a second. So this was a message history between myself and a colleague, Luke Daly, who is a lecturer in my department at Glasgow. And this is me saying at half seven in the morning on a Monday morning, Luke, did you pick up the fireball last night? And he said, yes, I just woke up to some very excited emails. And I said, do you reckon there was a fall? M meaning we didn't just see a shooting star. Did it actually drop a, a rock? And he said, yes, but probably lots of small fragments. And then me asking, do we, you know, will they actually be found? And he said, hmm probably would be tricky with lockdown, AKA people, you know, weren't allowed to leave the house um, for any, you know, non-essential reason. And then me asking, you know, 
has it have they managed to triangulate this more on what that means in a moment and then uh, at 904 and and you'll see this was by the way less than 12 hours after the fireball that i'll show you in a moment was actually seen he says this don't spread it yet but we're about to release issue a press release saying we estimate that it could have landed between a point just north of cheltenham and still on the world so this is the context this is my beginnings of this bo bo like bonkers story and um, but but let's just give you a bit more uh, info before we tell the story a bit more because i understand that not all of you are probably planetary scientists there's probably a lot of jargon a few words here and there you're probably already saying what on earth is a meteorite what's a meteor what's a fireball so here's a handy little graphic for you a meteor is a streak of light um, when a meteoroid, which is basically a rock floating around in space, when it heats up in the atmosphere, a meteor flies through the atmosphere. That is your shooting star. Um, when you have um, a lot of meteor meteors, when they hit it to the ground, when they make it to the ground, they become a meteorite. So these are normally dark rocks, black rocks that hit the ground. And um, if they're just little fragments floating around in space, those are our meteoroids. If they're really big things, um, but not as big as a planet or a moon, then they're an asteroid. And that's those are rocky bodies, okay? And they're quite um, sort of dusty, rocky things. But if they're more icy rather than rocky, then they're a comet. And comets have a very elliptical orbit. That means they're kind of stretched out. Um, and they release lots of pretty gases. So you might have seen pictures maybe of Halley's Comet, a very famous one. Um, comets are very pretty, um, whereas asteroids, we don't, we can't see them quite as, you know, they don't show up as, as prettily as, as an, um, comets show up really beautifully and asteroids, not so much. Um, and so meteorites themselves, things that land to Earth, they are the building blocks of the solar system. Um, and they come from, a lot of them mostly from asteroids, these big rocks floating around in space. They even come from Mars and some of them from the moon themselves. And they are super valuable and super interesting to people like me because we can use them to study exactly how our solar system formed. Um, because some of the asteroids in our solar system haven't been changed since almost the dawn of the birth of our solar system. These rocks have kind of been formed and then untouched for billions of years. So if we can study these asteroids, we can say, hmm, what was the solar system like before the Earth was even a thing? And that is why these are so exciting. And as you'll see later, that's why Winchcombe is so amazing. And that is why it's so important to collect meteorites. And this is why um, a bunch of people very recently, in the last four or five years, put a network of cameras around the UK saying we expect to be able to, we expect that there should be meteorites being collected in the UK and there aren't. Up until this year, there'd been not a single meteorite fall in the UK for 30 years, despite the fact, and that means as in one seem to fall. That's despite the fact that the maths, as in like probability, tells us there should have been one about every year. That's a lot of science we've missed out on, despite the fact we're a pretty, you know, population dense country. People should have seen it, right? Okay, we're quite cloudy too, so that comes into it. So a team called the UK Fireball Network, which my colleague Luke, the one I texted at the beginning, he went round, Luke went round driving around the country, sticking these cameras in dark areas of dark sky, um, sticking these cameras up to say let's track them he hooks them up to these um basically uh little mini um python computers um which track the night sky and can actually pick apart a fireball from a satellite from a airplane for example and when when one falls some very clever mathematicians can actually work out where the thing falls and there's not just people like the Fireball Network. There's lots of different groups who care about this stuff, who monitor the night sky. There are amateur astronomers, there are meteor observers, and really, really conveniently, uh, less than a year before the pandemic hit, as in late in 2019, 
a bunch of these groups of these organizations all got together very conveniently in London and had a big meeting and they said, what if a UK meteorite fell? What would we do? How would we react? Who would we get together? And what would happen? And they formed this group called the UK Fireball Alliance and they basically made an action plan. And very conveniently, when our pal Winchcombe fell in 2021, <laughs> yes, they hadn't planned for a pandemic, but they could put this, pa this plan into action. So here was our fireball. I'll show you a video of it, which is collected from one of these members of the Fireball Alliance. This is from the UK Meteor Observation Network. And here is our, um, here is that fireball. And what you can see is a really bright streak across the sky. And if you watch as it goes down to the sort of bottom end, you might be able to see it kind of gets brighter and then it kind of seems to splinter up a little bit. You might see lots of little streaks sort of um, seems to kind of get bright, then dark and lots of little spots. That kind of suggests that this thing fragmented or at least the mathematicians could kind of work that out. Um, and that's what told them, oh, we think there's probably going to be lots of little bits. And what was amazing was this fireball was seen all over the place, not just by people with fancy cameras, literally people with those Amazon doorbells picked it up and um, people just with dash cams caught it. Um, and it was all over Twitter. Just that Sunday evening, it was everywhere. I mean, you know, pubs were shut. What else are you going to do? Um, so amazing. Just I was sat there just scrolling, being like, oh, my gosh. Um, if you search fireball, you know, on Google Trends you, and you search that for the whole of the UK for the whole year, there is a massive peak just for that week. And it's all from this one thing. And there's not nothing the rest of the year. Um, so it turns out this thing ended up being the most recorded fireball ever. This is a map of the people who saw it just from um, where we, we asked, basically, if you saw it, let us know, because we can use every recorded observation to get the maths more and more certain and um, because every um every video allows the really fancy um basically computer modelers to feed that into their um data set to work out where it was going to fall and also where it came from as well so people saw it all over britain and even into europe as well and from that hours later we were able to do track and trace we were able to say Right, well, we can work out likely where is the fall area in the southwest, probably somewhere near Cheltenham in Gloucestershire. And so this was the point where we said, right, there is likely going to be a stone we think in this area happens to center upon the village of Winchcombe, but we didn't know it at the time. We said somewhere in this area. And on that Monday, our, my colleague Ashley King from the Natural History Museum goes on television, goes on the BBC and says, hey, look, if you are out and about and don't go out and about anywhere you shouldn't be because it's locked down but if you see a black rock where a black rock shouldn't be tell us tell the natural history museum tell the uk meteor observation network send us a photo and we'll check it out because we expect there to be a meteorite somewhere in the southwest expecting maybe there might be a few people get involved <laughs> There certainly were a few people that got involved. There were all sorts of people sent in photos. People got very enthusiastic, thinking, yes, I found a meteorite. Sadly, quite a lot of them were not meteorites. They were what we call meteor wrongs. We said, send us in a black rock. Maybe you can see this is not a black rock. Um, but we were really grateful. There was just loads and loads of enthusiasm from the public. And amongst lots of enthusiasm, lots of people sending in um, pictures we did have some positive um, and indeed actual meteorites found and the first and most famous one was this so this was a picture sent in from a guy called rob wilcock um, of a bit of smashed dirt on his driveway and the story goes so him and his family on that sunday evening i think they were watching telly and uh his daughter had heard like a sort of clattering noise on that Sunday night and just sort of didn't really think anything of it. Um, and then they all went off to bed and then they'd actually seen, they'd heard and seen the press release, seen the news to keep an eye out for black rocks. And then, <laughs> then they went out to their driveway in the morning and saw this smash of black dirt that kind of looked like kind of a 
coal, a piece of coal had smashed on their driveway. And they were pretty sure, hmm, we heard some clattering. We, it's black. We definitely didn't put it there. Let's, and we know we're slap bang in this area. Maybe we should get in touch. Um, and that got uh, colleagues very excited. And my, um, one of the scientists at the Open University, who have a very big planetary science team, this guy, Richard Greenwood, didn't live so far away from Gloucestershire, and he was able to drive. And as he, as he very famously said, his knees went all wobbly as soon as he got there and saw this driveway, and he knew exactly that it was um, what a very, not just a meteorite, it was a very precious kind of meteorite, and one that he'd actually been studying for many years as well. So he gets, so this was on the 1st of March. The family were really good. They scooped it up within hours of it, of the, of it falling and it hadn't rained or anything like that. So it was super pristine. And then by the um, Wednesday, this is Richard and this is Ashley on that driveway um, outside on the light of using the light of their phones, trying to pick out as many bits as they could, putting them in foil, having a look. Um, and, but at this point we thought, well, Maybe you'll remember from that picture that we saw from the video, it sort of looked like it's fragmented. Um, and also we had this whole area where we think this thing might be. Um, so I'm gonna send you another screenshot now. So I hadn't known anything of this at this point. And um, this was all kept super under wraps. Um, I stopped scrolling Twitter and actually managed to do some of my PhD for a couple of days. I get this message on the Wednesday morning from Luke. Holy, I just got off the phone with Ashley and Richard. Ashley and Richard met one of the Black Rock finders and reckons it's a CM chondrite. Ashley is on his way now. Don't spread this. Also means we will definitely still go down. Um, that's incredible. Have you got a pick? And here is the picture of the dish. So now this is the point where Luke had just rang me earlier to say, hypothetically, would we be able to drive? Would I be able to be up for driving all the way to Cheltenham from Glasgow, which is about seven hours drive? Um, so at this point, it was a frantic: how do we get the health and safety approvals to for the university to allow us to travel all that way? When at the time, uh, Nicola Sturgeon or the Scottish government had a rule where you can't travel more than five miles for a non-essential purpose. How do we get the university to show them that? Yes, this is an essential reason to go collect a once in a lifetime meteorite. Um, we were worried about how do we cross the border? What if the police stop us? But eventually we got it, we got it all. No one did stop us after many um uh much angst. Here is us in a car park at I think six in the morning. Um and so I thought I just I did actually film myself um on the way down because it was such a momentous occasion. I live in a top floor flat with not even a uh, balcony or anything. So I, and I hadn't left my tiny little suburb of Glasgow, which doesn't have any green space or anything for God knows how long. Um, so it was massive even just to be able to leave. So I thought I'd just play this little video of how I felt. So I am just about to drive down to Lancaster en route to Cheltenham. Uh, because we are going to go meteorite hunting. Um, so excited. There hasn't been a meteorite fall in the UK for 30 years. And here we are in a pandemic going hunting for one. So this is me just getting petrol. Just got petrol and off I go. So that was on the Wednesday evening at the start of my journey. And then this is a Thursday morning. So it is 9.06. I am at TBA service station. And I'm waiting for my colleagues to catch up um, so that we can go on to our hotel for this evening. Um, won't be long. And I'm wondering how I'm going to sleep tonight because I am so flipping excited. Just kind of can't really believe that I might be picking up a meteorite tomorrow or indeed the next day. Um, yeah, pretty flipping stoked. 
So this was my first little thoughts on my drive down, leaving Glasgow for the first time in, in quite a while. And um, so this was me, will I be picking up a meteorite the next day? And I did. Um, so my uh, colleague Natasha snapped this photo of me being shown the meteorite from the driveway, a bag of it for the first time. And you can see just how excited I was when I arrived in Cheltenham on the Thursday morning. Um, yeah, I think it kind of says it all. It does look like I'm being proposed to by Ashley, which is pretty hilarious, really. I mean, it is a rock, um, but no, me and Ashley are not not a couple not getting married. Um, so uh, here's another picture of me. You can see a bit more of it. This is a bag of the stuff from the driveway. Uh, my favorite thing about this photo is that it's Waitrose Essentials. Famously, they were, you know, loved to have their essentials. Who knew that part of Waitrose Essentials is now Meteorite too. So what was the point of us going down there? Why did we need, why did I have to get all these um, health and safety approvals? Well, like I said, we were pretty sure there was, um, this thing had fragmented and there were lots of other pieces and that it was a pretty valuable meteorite. And most of that area of Gloucestershire is just fields. So we spent six days walking up and down fields in a kind of long line doing kind of like a forensic search essentially looking for small, dark, shiny things in the uh, Cotswolds countryside. Um, you were, it was handy because it's the sort of thing you actually want to be socially distanced for anyway, uh, to be efficient because you have to go up in a straight line, pivot round and then back the way, cover as many fields as you can. Um, and so you want to be at least two metres apart because you can kind of scan uh, two metres around you quite easily anyway and um, so that was lucky because obviously we, we, we were all um, coming from all over the place so we had colleagues for the search obviously we didn't want to tell the public to go out and hunt because of um we had to we had special insurance and things to do that because of covid um so we didn't want to get the public involved because it wasn't it wouldn't have been approved but so we had people from glasgow plymouth manchester open university Natural History Museum, Imperial, people from all over the UK and um, different planetary science researchers come together um, to socially distance search for meteorites, which is very strange because we were all good friends who've known each other and worked together for a few years, who all obviously we hadn't seen each other in at least a year. And yet we obviously had to stay socially distance this whole time and it was work, but it was a very exciting thing and it was all very odd. Um, but a massive pleasure to be there anyway and um, we never really expected to find anything in the field but we wanted it we needed to say that we've we tried and um, it was yeah so we had walked up and down so many fields and um, obviously we didn't just turn up and um, we wouldn't just go into any old field and just search it most of this land was private land and um, and so we would what and what was so we'd have to be knocking on doors and saying to people um hi would you have to explain hi, there might be a meteorite in your fields. Um, could we look for it? And we had to explain what that meant. And that was the absolute best, best thing about this. And I can't put it into words how this felt is we were so worried when we arrived, so worried about what the people of Gloucestershire would think and, and how, what the reception would be to a bunch of scientists turning up in lockdown, banging on about some meteorite. But actually... The reception we had from the people of Gloucestershire was amazing. Everyone was so friendly, so welcoming. I think there was only one person who wouldn't let, let us search on their land out of just so many landowners, so many farmers. People just were just so happy, which is amazing, right? Because we, you know, that it was it was at a really it was at a time when the whole country was completely shut down, you know, um, and I just remember feeling so heart warmed by it arriving under so much anxiety um to feel like actually this is incredible um because they they could have thought gosh who are these folk but actually it was just lovely and um, so most of the time it was short grass um and yes it was tricky because when you're looking for a dark shiny thing in the ground about the size of your fist or smaller in a field in farmland a lot of the time that might be poo but also there might have been there was a lot of the time that was very tricky to rain 
So we'd be in grounds like this, where if there was a meteorite, well, it might have fallen, rolled down this hill and gone into a bush. There were ponds and all sorts of things like that. So um, yes, it was very good fun. And we had um, lots of bonkers times, but there was a lot of scrambling through brambles, bushes, all sorts to just really be as thorough as we could. And um, we spotted a lot of meteorongs, had a good laugh of all kinds of little things we saw in the ground. Um, and saw a lot of really misleading meteorongs, like dark things we saw in the ground that were, you know, really could well have been meteorite. Um, and I'd like to draw your attention to this one in particular. So this was one meteorong that we saw. And this is a piece of Winchcombe um, in the lab at the NHM. Um, and it just shows how easily you can be misled, especially when you've walked miles and miles all day staring at black, black rocks and you're a bit shattered and you're covered in bruises. Um, so here is Winchcombe, it's dark, it's got like little white splodges in, it's got some smoother bits, different textures. And this, uh, I guess, a bit of, who knows, maybe a bit of asphalt or rock, I'm not sure. Um, got a lot of the same stuff, it's got different textures, it's, got, it's dark with some white blobs in, it's got smoother areas. So there was a lot of times where we'd pick things up and be like, oh, that's it, and it's not. So you get your hopes up and get them down again. Um, this was a piece of meat winchcombe that was found a few weeks later by um, some other meteorite hunters, so not the um, science team. And uh, just to show you how small some of the pieces of winchcombe actually are, and compared to some, sometimes what we would think were bits of winchcombe, but were just pieces of poo. And uh, it's just to say how much time we actually spent picking up poo. Um, and it not in fact being meteorite and it being poo. And um, so there were ups and downs very much so in our in our time traipsing through the Gloucestershire countryside in March. Um, but one of the funniest things or one of the highlights for me, I'd say, is what it did for my fitness. Um, this is a graph, a screenshot of my step count throughout lockdown. So it starts in April 2020, ending in March 2021. And this is literally just the effect of doing the meteorite hunt, what it did on my average step count. Um, and this just shows how much lockdown, how little exercise I've, I had done in lockdown and what living in a flat and working from home has done to how little exercise I do. It's pretty embarrassing, really. Um, but it shows just how much more I did and how much it affected the whole month of March for me there. So I just thought that was a bit of fun. So some good sides, even just for the exercise, but best moment by far during the whole hunt was it uh, just after nine o'clock on the morning of the Saturday, the 6th of March, we were in a sheep field uh, belonging to a enormous estate. I literally felt like I was in an episode of Myths and Murders. It was beautiful. Um, and this is my supervisor, Lydia just walking in front of me I took this picture because I thought what a gorgeous day it was a cold spring morning but really pr really pretty at 20 past nine and then at 9 39 this happened so what you just saw was the celebration from when we first, the first, the first and only bit that was found by the field search, our Glasgow team. Um, and this was the only piece of Winchcombe that, and the biggest piece of Winchcombe that has been found. So that morning, this was on the Saturday. Um, by this point, all the other scientists um, had gone home for the weekend because most of them were from much closer to Gloucestershire than Glasgow was. So we were we were like, well, we've come all so far from Glasgow. We may as well stay because we're not just going to go home for the weekend because it's a seven hour drive. So we're going to keep doing the searching. Um, and so what was really what was really lovely was this piece was actually found by um, my colleague Luke's girlfriend, Mira. Um, so she'd actually joined us on the search because the university had decided that um, to minimize um, kind of exposure risk and generally just to improve for health and safety purposes, we had to have the smallest number of households possible go on the search. Um, and Mira, living with Luke, the university said, hey, like, why doesn't she go with Luke? And um, because they've got a car, they can join. She can share the driving as well because it's such a long way. 
so Mira joined Luke on the drive down to Gloucestershire on the Wednesday night. But for the first two days, um, Mira wasn't actually allowed, wasn't able to join on the search um, because she was still working in the weekdays. So she was working in her hotel room on the Thursday and Friday. Very sad that we were all out and about um, in the um, beautiful Cotswolds. Um, so that Saturday morning, she was absolutely, honestly, like the most excited person ever. I mean, she's like the most enthusiastic person anyway. I mean, she makes me look really dull and you might have picked up. I'm quite a generally cheery, enthusiastic person. Like she makes me look sullen. And um, so that Saturday morning, she was bubbly as anything. And she was saying that she was secretly kind of pleased we hadn't found anything yet because she'd kind of wanted to be there. Um, anyway, so... Um, because she had joined us, she wasn't, she's not actually a planetary scientist. She works in HR for a pharmaceutical company and she doesn't, and she hadn't been there the first two days. She'd really not got into it. So we'd spent that first hour that morning from about half past eight in the line of, um, the group of us and Mira kept saying, Oh, I think I found one, but obviously we were in a sheep field and it was always sheep poo. So this happened about eight times. Oh, is that one? No, sorry, Mira, it's poo. Oh, what about that one? No, it's poo. But this one, she's seen it out of the corner of her eye, a kind of shiny black thing. And she thought, oh, I think that's it. And she kind of had an argument in her mind because she's been saying, no, oh, I don't want to stop us again for like the eighth time. But thankfully, we're very grateful she said to Luke no I really do think this is I really do think that's a rock not a poo <laughs> and gosh she did and what a beautiful stone it was <laughs> it'll show you again and you can see just how easily it could have been a poo because that there is literally sheep wool Screaming is me, by the way. Um, so here we are. Here is this piece of rinch gum, literally dug, in, dug into the grass there. It's a pretty beautiful thing. You can even see the sort of scorch marks as it came through the atmosphere, as it sort of burned up. It's really, really stunning. Um, here's a picture of my supervisor, Lydia, with Luke, with that piece dug into the ground. And you can see how easily you could have missed it. So it's amazing that someone who wasn't even a planetary scientist, not a meteorite person at all, spotted it. So it was a incredible. So obviously, there was a cause for celebration. Obviously, we had to get a bottle of fizz out. But what the first thing we had to do before that was actually find the landowners. And this was a whole world I hadn't learned, despite being a meteor meteoriticist, because that's the word, a word. Um, is that there's actually all these kind of rules about this kind of thing, and it's sort of similar to treasure, apparently, um, which is that if a meteorite falls on your land, it belongs to you. Um, so it was up to the landowner of what, what to do with it. And so this was 20 past nine on a Saturday morning, um, and so we, we'd we actually seen that the, land, the lady who'd owned the land had gone out and left. Um, so I was running around trying to see if I could find anybody else um, and we'd sort of heard that her son might be around, um, but I couldn't find her at first. So what I did find, which was very lovely, was one of the tenants on her estate, because it's that posh that she had her own tenants on the estate. Um, I went and found her who had the owner's number, and she was very excited and was uh, actually had a great time getting to know us. And she left us a bottle of whiskey and, and glasses out to celebrate with us as well, which was very sweet. And it's just a testament of just how excited these people were. Um, and then further still, um, yes, it belongs, meteorites belong to anyone whose land they're on. Um, but every single piece that was found at this stage, and I think there were about five pieces, one that was found by the search team and the rest were just found by owners themselves. They were all donated for free to the Natural History Museum, um, which is amazing because these things were really valuable and, and pieces that were found subsequently ended up being super valuable um, and sold for crazy amounts of money. So the pieces we found at this point, the fact that they were all donated for free was absolutely amazing and we're just so grateful for that. So then it was a case of how do we get this thing out of the ground? Um, it had made its own little mini crater, would you believe? And um, so here was the thing dug deep into the ground um, and we had one glove and one little bag. And it was a case of let's just get this thing out as best as we can. But 
can you stay to socially distance when you've got a team of you? It was tricky. Um, at least we're outdoors, so we were well ventilated. Um, but what is amazing, what we're so pleased with is that the whole system works. From the fireball network, the cameras, to the fact we put a call out on Twitter, to on BBC Breakfast, to the fact people sent in their pictures, to now we actually got a piece, the biggest piece ever, the biggest piece of the whole, st of the whole meteorite was the one we found in the field, thanks to all of this put together. Um, so that was just just so lovely and especially not left not least to for it to have happened during a pandemic when there were just so many more hurdles as well and um, so what happened next well some sophisticated preliminary analysis how much of it do we have about two chocolate bars weight full in the piece that we found in the field and in terms of how much we had from the driveway well here is a snapshot um from the work that my colleagues at the natural history museum did um it's a big job curating um, meteorites, not least when you've got a piece you didn't expect. <laughs> and not just um, individual stones and fragments, they even had to curate the pieces they were found in. And we've got more Waitrose essentials here. Here's the Waitrose cottage cheese tubs that they put the sample in as well. Um, and what's exciting for you folks in London who are watching here tonight, uh, our piece that we found in the field is the piece that is now on display at the Natural History Museum. So if you go in, um, if you go into the NHM, you can see our sample. This is the piece that we found in that grass. It is in a, on a lovely display cabinet and you'll be able to go have a look and you can say, hey, I know that story now. I've seen how it was formed, uh, it was found and I've heard the high pitched scream of that moment as well. Um, so why is this thing so special? Well, it we very recently got its official classification and its official classification is what we call a cm2 um, and that's a type of what we call a carbonaceous chondrite um, and i'll explain in a moment what that means but why is this so special well it's the first uk meteorite fall as in one to have been seen to be recovered in for 30 years not least in a flipping pandemic and it's the first one to have a known orbit. So what do I mean by that? Well, do you remember earlier I showed you that picture of all those people who saw it and every camera, every doorbell, every who picked it up, every dash cam, all of those contributed to the fact that we were able to um, run some crazy maths to work out its potential where it fell, but also track that route back to where it probably came from in the solar system and that's the first time we've been able to do that in the uk and um, it's the first ever meteorite of this kind which is a uh, in the uk of this kind which is a carbonaceous chondrite and i'll explain in a moment just why why that's so exciting and um, and what's so amazing as well about this particular fall and the, is the fact we picked it up so quickly so the amazing Wilcock family who um, scooped it off off the driveway, put it into that cottage cheese tub and made meant it was so pristine. It kind of rivals the sort of samples we get from NASA missions that go to asteroids, go to the moon even, and pick up actual samples from asteroids and say, actually, we've spent billions of dollars going to an asteroid when this is a piece of asteroid that's landed on a driveway and it's not that much more contaminated. I mean, yes, there's going to be a bit of contamination, but for the fact that this was free and our entire system down to, to the press release, to the amazing public, everything, that is it's just incredible. And I, I really can't overstate that. So in terms of the orbit, we think it comes from just the sort of most of the way, like it comes from the asteroid belt, but closer to Jupiter than it is to Mars. So our asteroid belt lies between Mars and Jupiter. And we think Winchcombe comes from an asteroid sort of closer to Jupiter than Mars. Um, and the complicated mathematicians will, would be able to tell you more than I can on that. This is not what I do. And you'll see in a moment what my role in this. So why is this particular type of um, meteorite so exciting? A CM chondrite or this particular type of carbonaceous chondrite. Well, it's from an asteroid that hasn't been changed in any way, no geology going on for 4.6 billion years. That's a really, really, really long time. So real amazing snapshot into the early solar system there. 
And um, it contains about two to three weight percent carbon. So it, by mass, two to three percent of it is carbon. That's exciting because you, me, every living thing that we know of on this planet is kind of based on carbon, on organic molecules. And if this really primitive, as in a thing that's 4.6 billion years old, is full of carbon, then maybe this is the kind of building blocks of life. This is the early, earliest sort of life stuff we've got in the universe. So hugely exciting and very important for us. And, and not just carbon that's important for life, so is water. And CM chondrites have loads of water locked up in the minerals of these meteorites. So hugely important um, when we're trying to understand where did life come from, where do the building blocks of what we need to survive come from? Um, and in terms of where it fits in with uh, meteorites in general, there are six, about 66,000 known meteorites. And this, by the way, is courtesy of one of the parents of the school. So thank you to Sarah Russell, who I believe might be watching tonight. Um, so she is a professor at the Natural History Museum. So if you do come and visit to the museum, uh, she might be there and might be able to show you around. And um, so thanks to Sarah for providing this. There's about 66,000 known meteorites. And of those, about 26,000, 27,000 are carbonaceous contracts, these carbon rich ones. And only 51 of those are falls, as in ones that we've seen to fall through the sky rather than ones that have just been noticed and picked up. And only four of those are ones that we've actually got orbital data, as in we can track the fall back because we've got enough footage and work out where it came from in the solar system. So Winchcombe is amazing. We know loads about where it came from. It's a really rare meteorite. It's the only type of one of this kind that have fallen in the UK. Why, in terms of where it plays for me, not just for being a part of this amazing thing in lockdown, but from my perspective, there are organic molecules. These are carbon-based molecules in there that are older than the earth itself. And these could be the leftover ingredients from the recipes for life. And this is where I actually got to be involved in not just you know, finding the meteorite and being in the search team, I got to study it as well. So after six days of um, being out in the field, falling over countless times, getting covered in mud, and um, sadly our team didn't find any more pieces, but we found the biggest bit, so that was good. <laughs> Uh, after, after doing that, I got back to Glasgow, I think on the Monday night, that was the same night that the press release went out. Um, so I got back to Glasgow about the exact time that the embargo was lifted and the world knew about this meteorite. Um, and then the next day I was told by my supervisors, um, Hey, stop what you're doing with your PhD you need to plan an experiment to do next week to study this meteorite instead. And that's because I, um, um, I in my PhD, I've been designing experiments to study carbon-based molecules in, um, in meteorites. And because this is a carbonaceous meteorite, it's a carbon-bearing meteorite, um, I, you know, I, I had, had experiments I could do I just needed within a week to get all the chemicals together, figure out how to do it in COVID because my lab had been shut for a whole year. And um, so the very next week we get a piece of Winchcombe shipped up to us and I start crushing it. So this is a video of me in the lab um, just south of Glasgow. The heating had broken during COVID. So I had to wear a coat under my lab coat, which is why I look a bit like the Michelin man. Um, and I was crushing up pieces of Winchcombe in order to expose as many of the organic molecules as they could um, to then basically um, weigh it out and put it into loads of tiny little vials um, with the idea being to see kind of what different molecules are in there. So we do that by crushing it up, putting it into lots of different vials, as you'll be seeing here. And it's really hard because um, you have to weigh it out into sort of micrograms uh, milligrams at a time, um, because this stuff is so precious, we need to use so little of it. Um, and literally, if you sneeze, you lose it all. Um, so I was very scared <laughs> a lot of the time, because this is such a precious thing. So um, 
yes, very nervous. Um, and then once you sort of crushed it and put it into lots of little vials, then the idea is you put add these special chemical chemicals called solvents, which basically dissolve the organic molecules in there. Um, so my experiment basically crushed it, added special chemicals, which extracted all the um, lots of carbon bearing molecules from our samples of Winchcombe. And um, uh, the idea then was just basically to see what was in there. So we didn't know what we were going to find. We had a good idea from the um, classification of meteorite that it would be, but it was basically a case of let's just see what different um, what our solvents would pick up. And we sent them all to a fancy machine called a mass spectrometer, um, or a it's called a liquid chromatography mass spectrometer, which basically separates out in a really long tree really really long tube i think 90, 90 meters long something like that um and it separates out all the different molecules in there and then it um but by like how sort of heavy they are and then it kind of tells you out the other side what's in there by their mass and um what's exciting is so far so good um i've seen to have found lots of different carbon-based molecules in there um it's been actually really amazing being part of not just um, the search team, but actually being part of the science team, we've called it, in Winchcombe as well, because this was a sample that came out of nowhere. Obviously, we didn't know that Winchcombe was going to fall. Um, it was small and dark. You don't have any warning of the thing. Um, and it was a really precious sample that we wanted to study straight away. And so suddenly, one part that hadn't been planned for in this hypothetical thing was how do we decide who's going to do what? Um, and so what it was what was decided was basically make a bunch of teams um, across lots of universities, lots of different collaborations to say, okay, one team will look at um, all the nanoscale stuff, like really small things. One team will look at how magnetic it is. Um, and that's what's been so amazing is actually we've all been able to get together every few months over Zoom and just kind of share all our thoughts and what we found about this stone. And it has, it's proven to be quite unusual and quite interesting. Um, and what's even more exciting for me is it isn't just, it isn't just cool to be a part of it because it's, um, it's, you know, the first UK meteorite in 30 years, but also because it really actually fits in with my PhD. So my PhD um, I look at organic molecules in Martian meteorites. So these are rocks from Mars that have been ejected from the Martian surface um, from like an asteroid or a meteorite that's hit Mars, flown off into space and then landed on Earth. Um, and I basically study carbon-based molecules in those to try and understand if Mars has the right um, kind of building blocks for life. So this is the Curiosity rover on Mars. And these are the kind of organic molecules, for those of you who know any chemistry, that, that um, we find on Mars. And I'm kind of trying to understand where did Mars get its carbon from? And we don't know that. Um, we don't know where Mars got its organic molecules from. Is it life? Is it um, kind of from inside the mantle? Or is it actually from meteorites that have dropped it on Mars um, and sort of deposited it there? And if it was, it would be meteorites like Winchcombe. So this whole thing has been totally wild because it couldn't have come at a better time because I've basically got a whole new array of samples deposited on a driveway um, <laughs> just right in the end of my PhD, uh, which has just allowed a whole new data set, a whole new chapter of my PhD right at the end. Um, so yeah, I can't put into words what an amazing thing it's been to be a part of not at least just being able to leave the house at that point. Um, and I'm going to leave you with an excellent cartoon that was in Private Eye when it hit the news because it did go, it did really explode um, in the media, the story when it happened. I guess it was a really lovely piece of good news in amongst a lot of sad stuff at the time. Um, and it says this, no dear, you've not found a student piece of meteorite on the drive. That's a fox turd. Um, so I'll leave you at that and please chuck any questions in the chat. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.